Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on the place that you are joining us today. Uh, thank you very much uh, for attending this webinar, where we are going to be talking about the effects of the transparency regulation in your food and feed applications that will be assessed by EFSA. Before we start, I just want to let you know that if you look at the bottom of the Zoom interface, uh, you're going to notice there is a chat. So please use that chat uh, to send me all of your questions, and if I have time, I will reply to those at the end of the presentations. Shortly, we will start to, to see everything that we have for you today. As I said before, we are going to be talking about the implications of this uh, new European regulation on transparency on food and feed applications that will be assessed by EFSA. Before we start, I just want to talk to you a little bit, or I just want to let you know a little bit which are how, how the presentation is structured. So we are going to start taking a look to the rationale behind why the transparency regulation uh, was put together and is going to be implemented in Europe. After that, we're going to go straight to talk specifically about all of those articles that are going to apply to your food uh, and your feed applications. By the end, we're going to finish with a summary of which are the main implications for all the parts involved um, in, in this assessment. We're going to be talking about which are the implications for applicants, which are the implications for the contract risk organizations, and also which are the implications for the public. And since, we, since you probably saw in our adverts for this webinar, this is actually the second edition of this webinar. So therefore, in previous edition, we already received uh, some questions from uh, people involved in the application procedure that we are going to be sharing uh, with you today. So let's get started. Uh, everyone knows the regulation as the transparency regulation, but the actual legal name or the actual name of the regulation is Regulation uh, 2019 1381. And in this first slide, I just want to notice, uh, want you to notice that there are two dates. So we have the entry into force date that it, it was actually last year, the 26th of, se of September of 2019. But the day that you have to mark on your calendar is the 27th of March of 2021. So that is the date uh, from which the transparency regulation is going to apply. So therefore, all the applications that you submit from that date onwards are going to be assessed, taking into account the requirements of the transparency regulation. I also want to let you know that uh, there is a, a small exception on this date that are 4.4 and 5 of Article 1. Uh, those points are going to entry into force or are going to apply from the 1st of July of 2022. And those points are related to the members of the EFSA management board, to the scientific committee and the scientific panels. Also for you to know, everything that is related to these uh, groups, we are not going to be talking about those uh, in this webinar. We are only going to focus on the articles that apply to, your, to the authorizations or at any application that are going to be assessed by EFSA. There is a total of nine legislative acts that are going to be affected by the transparency regulations. On a first place, and is also the regulation where you're going to see the biggest impact of the transparency regulation is the general food law. And that one is the one that applies for both, uh, for food and for feed applications. So we are going to be focusing on that one. But also for you to know, the transparency regulations uh, also applies to the regulation on genetically modified food and feed, to the regulation 1831 on feed additives, to the regulation uh, dealing with uh, smoke flavorings, uh, food contact materials, food additives, enzymes, and flavorings, to plant protection product, plant protection products that are uh, pesticides, biocides, to novel foods and also to the Directive uh, 2001, that is the Directive on the Deliberate Release into the Environment of Genetically Modified Organisms. 
why are we getting this regulation? There is a reason behind it. So on a first place is due to the fitness checks of the general food law. This fitness check started in 2014 and finished in 2018. And as a consequence of the fitness checks of the general food law, the authorities realized that it was a need to improve transparency and the independence during the evaluation of regulated products. And the authorities also realized that there was a need to improve the risk communication. But also we are getting this uh, new regulation in response to a European citizens initiative that it was called Ban Glyphosate and Protect People and the Environment from Toxic Pesticides from 2017. So of course the main objective of this uh, citizens initiative was to request the ban of glyphosate. Uh, for that first objective, um, the response was negative because the authorities considered that it was not enough scientific evidence to support uh, the request. But the second objective of that um, initiative was to ensure, to request to the authorities, to ensure that the scientific evaluation of pesticides for European regulatory approval is based only in published studies which are commissioned by competent public authorities instead of the pesticide industry. As a consequence of that second objective, the Commission commit to come forward with a legislative proposal aimed at, first, enhancing the transparency of the scientific assessment, and second, enhancing the quality and the independence of the scientific studies that are assessed by EFSA. So now let's get started with the most important part, which are actually those articles that you need to take into account when you are drafting that dossier, when you are planning those studies for a food or a feed application. So the topics that we're going to be talking about are pre-submission advice, notification of the studies, consultation of third parties, verification studies, transparency, what is going to be released to the public, confidentiality, how we are going to deal with confidentiality from now onwards, the protection of personal data, the standard data formats, and we're also going to be talking about this figure of fact-finding missions. We're going to start then with Article 32a, that it mentions the possibility of now requesting pre-submission advice for new applications. So now all the potential, potential applicants can request advice to the European Food Safety Authority. The first thing, please notice that this is optional for new applications, it's not mandatory. So on what can you request uh, advice to the authorities? You can request advice on first, which are the rules applicable to that um, dossier? and which is the content required. Now, there are things that we still don't know about this article. For example, we don't know uh, the format. Are you going to be, uh, is the authority going to be delivering the advice via a teleconference? Or do you have to write the request and send an email to EFSA? We also don't know how many times can you request advice. If I have to bet, I will say, only one time, but we don't know. We don't know if there is a limit. We also don't know if the applicants are going to be requested to pay a fee. We don't think so, but again, we don't know, so uh, we cannot be sure about that. So it's going to be interesting to, to get the feedback from the authorities in these points. Now, the possibility of requesting pre-submission advice is also is something that we see as very positive, but good for the industry. It has advantages. Why? On the first place, because now you're going to be able to confirm the right product category before spending any money on trials. Uh, this is particularly key for those products that are innovative. That is the first time that that type of active substance is going to go into the market because we know of cases where the applicant, think, um, uh, the applicant thinks, let's say, I have a fidelity application and I think that my product will classify as a technological and I have an interest in registering my additive in the technological category. And then they plan and execute all of the studies, put together the dossier, and then when they, after they submit the dossier, the authorities actually contact them and tell them, we are not going to accept that application under that category, we do not think that it applies, and then you can resubmit your dossier but with the studies for a different category. You can imagine the amount of time and money that you're going to basically waste in that case. So we hope to see 
a reduction um, in these type of situations. We also think that it's going to be good to confirm the specific amount of studies required. required. This is going to, of course, allow you a better uh, management of your resources, basically money. And as a consequence of these articles, we expect to see a reduction in the amount of clock stop that an applicant receives during the evaluation process. We have some internal numbers, and we know that uh, for federative applications during the last 10 years, specifically in the categories of technological and so technical, in average, 74% of applicants receive between one and two clock stops. And we know that the duration of that clock stop is of approximately eight months. So what we expect to see as a consequence of the pre-submission advice is a reduction in both the amount of clock, to or clock stops that the applicant receives, but also in the duration of these clock, clock stops, because otherwise we are just going to be adding, adding more time to the evaluation process. Article 32b regarding notification of studies. Now, EFSA is going to establish a database of studies that are commissioned by a fit business operator, operator for an application. And it is important for you to know that this notification of studies is going to be released to the public. All of the studies that you tell EFSA that you are going to plan for that application, that information is going to be made publicly available. However, the key thing is, when is the information going to be released to the public? after um, the application is considered valid and after EFSA uh, has finished uh, the assessment of confidentiality. How this is going to work? On a first instance, uh, we are going to start with the applicants. So the potential applicant is going to notify to EFSA the title of the study, the scope, the laboratory or contract risk organization where they are going to perform that study, and the approximate or estimated start and end date of that trial. But it's not only the applicant, it's also the laboratory or the contract risk organization involved in performing that trial who needs to comply with the notification requirement or obligation. They are basically going to notify the same information, title, scope, start and end date, and the only thing that is going to change is the, the, they have to report the name of the feed business operator. It is interesting that according to the regulation, this requirement of the notification is also going to apply to contract risk organizations that are located in third countries. So initially when we read uh, third countries, this is a very um, like open or wide definition. So it made us think, uh, is the, notif the, the requirement notification is going to apply if applicant uh, perform studies in Latin America, in India, in China. And we recently got some updates uh, regarding this point that we are going to share with you at the end of the presentation. So there are consequences if you fail to notify or you fail to submit the studies as a consequence of Article 32b. And on a first instance, what happens if the study is not notified to EFSA? then the application is not going to be valid unless you provide proper justification. But then what happens if there is no notification, which means that you submitted the study but you didn't notify it, but also there is not justification. Then the applicant can resubmit after they notified. But there are consequences. The assessment of the validity of that resubmitted applications is going to start after six months. So you better notify your study or you know automatically what is going to happen. Then the second scenario is what happened if you notify the study, but you didn't submit it. Basically the same that before. So your application is not going to be valid on, unless you provide a proper justification regarding why it is in the database for notifications, but they are not getting the information. So you do not submit and you do not justify. Again, you can resubmit the application, including all those studies that you notified, but then the assessment of the validity is going to start after six months. And then the third scenario is if a notified study is submitted partially to EFSA. So you complied with the, with the two previous steps. 
you notified and you submitted, but you submitted partially. Then the applicable time limits within which the authority shall deliver the scientific out output is going to be suspended. And that suspension is going to end after six months of submission of all data. Then be very careful. Do not submit uh, dossiers uh, with incomplete information just to pass validation because you know what is going to happen. But there are also uh, some points pending to clarify here because first, we still don't know if EFSA is going to put an effort to check in thoroughly all the information and let the applicant know at the beginning if one of these situations it is happening, particularly regarding with the submission of partial information, so all applicants are going to know at the beginning, like this is considered submitting partial information, therefore you are subjected to the penalty of six months, or if it's going to, it could happen at any point during the assessment. But we also don't know how strict it's going to be. Let's say that you only forget to copy and paste a Tuki test for one of the parameters and for the rest, you have a perfect study report. Is this penalty going to apply just for that minor fault or is this going to be handled in the current way uh, that we have with a normal clock shot where you're requested to submit supplementary information? Or is this something that is going to be uh, that only going to apply when you, there is a, a serious, uh, a critical fault, um, lack of information, such as the case when you forget to submit all of your statistical uh, printouts. So I think that we're only, perhaps we're only going to get uh, this information after EFSA uh, starts to assess applications under the new transparency regulations, but we're definitely going to, going to keep asking about in the meetings that EFSA is going to uh, organize before the 27th of March of 2021. The consultation of third parties, Article 32C. First of all, we are going to talk about the consultation of third parties in the case of renewal of authorizations. So in the case of renewal of authorizations, the potential applicant now has to notify to EFSA in advance the studies that they intend to perform as part of that renewal application. With that information, EFSA is going to launch a public consultation. And that public consultation is also going to, going to cover the design of the studies. So everyone is going to have access to the public consultation, general public, university, stakeholders, your competitors. Then EFSA takes the comments from stakeholders, competitors, university, the public, and then they are going to use that feedback to provide advice to the applicants on one, the content of the applications, and also the study design. Just as a quick comment, uh, the case of renewal applies to feed additives, to genetically modify food and feed, and to pesticides. And recently, the, the guidance on the renewal of the authorization for feed additives, uh, as recent as uh, November last year, was submitted, the draft was submitted for public consultation. We are now expecting to see the outcome of that public consultation, but up until today, the requirements when you submit a renewal application are for Section 2, identity, quality, information about recent batch-to-batch -batch variation and purity data. For Section 3, uh, post-market uh, monitoring and literature review, if applies, for supporting safety. And for Section 4, it was only required if uh, something had changed. So in this case, we expect to see already incorporations from the transparency regulations when the final draft is released. Now, consultation of third parties, but in the case of submission of an application, a new application. Something new. Now you have to submit to EFSA two dossiers. One dossier that is called uh, the, confidential ver the confidential version and one dossier that is the non-confidential version. So as soon as EFSA receives your application and is considered valid, EFSA is going to receive, uh, is going to release the non-confidential version to the general public. And in the meantime, they are going to start uh, the discussion on confidentiality. Once the assessment of confidentiality finishes, EFSA is going to release the rest of the pending information. Imagine that you requested something confidential, EFSA didn't agree, you agree with, the, uh, with that answers, with that assessment, so that uh, 
let's say, a story report is also going to be released to EFSA. And then, at that moment, EFSA is going to launch a public consultation to identify whether other relevant information, such as more scientific data, more studies from whoever, are available. This is going to be particularly relevant for people that are supporting certain things within the dossiers using literature review. Do not exclude uh, results from literature review because you may think that uh, it could be negative for your application because this is the point where EFSA is going to discover everything that is out there that it could be relevant for your application. So please include everything and just use the time to provide the authorities with the proper justification or interpretation of those results considering your, part your particular product. Then, when the scientific assessment concludes, EFSA is going to publish the scientific opinion, as we know it today, but also the outcome of that call uh, for data to the general public. Now, it is important that you notice that in this consultation of third parties, if EFSA receive, receives a lot of information and they consider they, they do not have enough time for the assessment of that um, information submitted by everyone, then a seven weeks extension of time uh, for delivering the scientific output could be added to your evaluation process. Verification of the studies, Article 32D. If there are controversies or conflicting results, now EFSA can and will commission studies directly to the contract research organizations. What they want to do is they want to just verify the evidence that you submitted. And it's important, important that the applicants notice that these studies may have a wider scope than that that was considered in the original application. Transparency what is going to be released to the public. So EFSA is going to make public the scientific data and studies that you include in your application, including supplementary information provided during the evaluation. This means that it's not only what you submitted initially. Everything that any additional request for supplementary information that is what we submit uh, when we receive a clock stop is also going to be released to the public. The summary of advice uh, provided to applicants at pre-submission phase is also going to be released uh, to the public once the application is considered valid. And then also the minority opinions and the results of the public consultations that we were talking about uh, in the previous section. This information is going to be available on the EFSA website and it's going to be available on an electronic format that everyone can download, print and search through. Also regarding confidentiality, which are the specific points uh, for which you can request a confidentiality protection or assessment or treatment. Upon request, EFSA, please notice that EFSA is highlighted in red, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, may grant confidential treatment only to manufacturing process and analytical methods, to technical and industrial specifications, in the case of federatives, to study plans for efficacy studies, but then the transparency regulation is very clear that is in relation to the aims of intended use. And yes, it applies to all federatives categories. Uh, regarding impurity specifications, except those that may have an adverse effect. You can also request confidential, uh, confidential treatment for the detailed description of the starting substance or preparation used for manufacturing the product in the case of food for the detailed description of the composition of material or products on which the sub substance intended for authorization will be used. So that will be the case of enzymes and also for analytical information on variability and stability of individual production batches. So the transparency in regulations uh, is very clear regarding the fact that uh, intellectual property, data exclusivity and protection is going to be guaranteed. Now, as I told you before, EFSA, I have highlighted EFSA in red because up until today and up until the 26th of, Mar 26th of March of 2021, this confidentiality uh, request has been assessed, uh, is assessed and is going to be assessed by the European Commission. 
Now this changes. Now it's EFSA who is going to be responsible. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. Um, is it going to be more efficient or is it going to take more time or is it going to be more complicated to come to an agreement? So we're going to have to wait and see. How are you going to request the confidentiality, like the practical implications? First of all, remember that for everything that you request to be treated as confidential, you need to provide a justification. Second of all, you have to prepare two applications. A practical meaning of these, two dossiers. The non-confidential version and the confidential version. And even in the confidential version, you need to take the time to clearly mark everything that you are requested to be treated as confidential. Let's say you mark it in red letters. So once the application is considered valid, the non-confidential version is going to be released to the public, as I said before. The applicant is going to be notified in writing if the authority intends to disclose some information. This is in the case where they do not agree with what you're requesting to be treated as confidential. So if the applicant disagreed, they can. One, or they withdraw the application, or two, they provide arguments. But they need to do this within two weeks of the notification. That, those two weeks for submitting that argument for which, uh, where you explain that you do not agree with um, EFSA opinion on the confidentiality is going to be called a confirmatory application. Then, if the applicant still disagrees with the response from the authority to the confirmatory application, they are going to have two weeks after the notification for withdrawing, for withdrawing the dossier or the information is going to be made public. So you need to be very, very car careful about the timelines once um, the confidentiality assessment starts. The decision on confidentiality will be taken within 10 weeks after receiving the request. But then we have the review of confidentiality, and this is new. After the scientific evaluation, meaning before the publication of the EFSA opinion, the authority can revisit its decision on confidentiality and change it. Of course, applicants are going to be duly notified. So this is also new. Now you have two parts of the assessment uh, where the authorities are going to review your request for confidentiality. So it's not like they did it at the beginning and then you do not have to worry again anymore, but you need to be prepared uh, for the case in which uh, the authorities decide after the whole assessment that there is something else that they want to release to the public and engage in the proper conversations with the authority if you do not, do not agree uh, with that decision. So remember, confidentiality is now going to be assessed twice. The protection of personal data, also something um, very delicate in, this, uh, in the whole evaluation process. What is going to be made public? The name and the address of the applicant, the names of authors of published or publicly available studies that were included supporting the application, and then the name of all participants and observers in meetings of the scientific committee and of the scientific panels, their working groups, and any other ad hoc group meeting. So there is nothing new here. But what uh, is not going to be public is the name and the addresses of natural persons involved in testing on vertebrate animals or in obtaining toxicological information. Please notice that this part is not covering uh, the name of the contract research organizations. In the case that you are like me and you need a little reminder of the, everything that is included in the vertebrate group, includes mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles and amphibians. So therefore, for those of you that are working uh, with, um, the feed, uh, with feed applications, that means that all of the studies for efficacy and safety um, that you submit within, within your application are uh, covered or are included in this requirement of the transparency regulation. Article 39F, standard data formats. The authority is going to draft a standard data formats uh, for submission of documents. These data formats should allow the function search, copy, print, and comply with regulatory requirements, which is uh, very good news because that this means that they are going to make sure 
of putting together uh, a template that is going to contain everything that you need to submit to the authorities. So therefore, it's going to reduce the chance that you're forgetting to include something that it, uh, that it will be relevant for the assessment. These uh, standard uh, data formats are going to be available online. And it seems, according to the transparency regulation, that they are going to cover all. Uh, dossier templates, how you reply to the authority when they request you for supplementary information, uh, or when you reply regarding whatever. Again, we think that this is a very good news. Uh, it's going to help a lot to applicants uh, to uh, standardize uh, the whole process, and it's going to be particularly relevant for those companies that are going to involve in drafting an application for EFSA assessment for the first time. Fact-finding missions. Now, a commission of experts can travel to laboratories, uh, to contract research organizations where the applicants um, are performing studies that are submitted, submitted for EFSA evaluation. And what they want to check, this commission of experts, is if those contract research organizations or laboratory are in compliance with relevant quality standards or relevant quality standards and if they are complying uh, with the notification obligation contemplated in Article 32b. Interestingly, the regulation also contemplates that these fact-finding missions could go to the definition of third countries. So again, <laughs> we're really looking forward to see how far away the authorities will travel in order to inspect uh, laboratories that are involved in performing trials for EFSA assessment. At this point, we have covered all of the specific art articles that are going to impact uh, your food and your feed applications. And now we are going to summarize we, uh, which are the implications of the transparency regulations for applicants, for contract research organizations, and for the general public. So we're going to start with the applicants. In the case of applicants, now they have the, pos the possibility of requesting pre-submission advice to EFSA. And this, we hope, it will save time and money. Now the applicants have to notify all studies performed for an application or a dossier to EFSA. If this procedure is not carried out properly, it's going to significantly delay the evaluation process. Remember, the six months. As a consequence also for applicants, now the competitors and the general public will get access to the advice provided by the authorities at pre-submission phase for both new applications and renewals. We also have that now EFSA could challenge the overall results of either an in vivo or an in vitro trials and request verification studies to make sure that they agree with those results that you provided initially. The applicants will need to be more careful uh, when requesting the treatment of certain data as confidential. This is information that was not considered uh, was not confidential before, but was only seen or assessed by the authorities, will now be released to the public. This is the case of animal trial study report. So basically what happens uh, with the information that you can treat as confidential, it has not changed when you can request as confidential. It's basically the same that we can request as confidential today. But there were things that you never worry about marking as confidential or requesting uh, this confidential treatment simply because they were not released to the public. The full final study report of an efficacy study for a fidelity application was not released to the public. But now you have to take the time to review that study report carefully, mark things as confidential, but also write the justification for each point that you want to request as confidential. So that is what it changes. As another point of implications for applicants, we have the now the information submitted to EFSA. We'll have to follow a specific data formats, as we say before, for dossiers, for supplying a supplementary information and that the confidentiality request will be assessed twice at dossier submission and after evaluation. Lastly, in the case of applicants, now preparing an application is going to require more time. Why? Because now applicants have to prepare the pre-submission paperwork, whether it is for a new applications or for renewals. You have to take time to go to the database and notify the studies, and it's something happens, remember, if you uh, submit but do not notify or you notify but you do not submit, remember that you need to provide a justification. The applicants also need to take more time to prepare two versions of the dossiers. Remember, the confidential and the non-confidential version. 
They have to prepare justifications for everything that is going to be marked as confidential. Again, extra time. And you need to mark and rec or mark for requesting um, as confidential information that before was not released to the general public. As we say before, like in the case of the full study reports for the different trials. In the case of the contract risk organizations, that are also impacted by the transparency regulation. Now the contract risk organization must notify all studies that are commissioned by companies and that they know they will be submitted to EFSA evaluation. It is still pending to clarify what is, what is going to happen if the applicant notifies the study but the CRO does not. All CROs involved in performing studies that will be assessed by EFSA could receive expansion, expansion, inspection sorry about that, from the authorities that are aimed at checking if they are compliant with one, the uh, relevant quality standard, but also with the notification obligation. The information about where all studies were performed, and this, it, this covers animal studies with live to, livestock or with laboratory animals, in vitro studies, whole genome sequence analysis, antimicrobial resistant phenotypic tests, is going to be publicly available. The information about name and addresses of people involved in the trials should be carefully marked as confidential or it could be released by mistake. So please also pay attention and mark that as confidential in your dossier. And the CROs uh, could, uh, should remember that they could receive a direct request from EFSA for performing a verification study under EFSA supervision. And the last case are the implications for the general public. Now the general public, remember that includes stakeholders, your competitors, people at university, everyone, will have access to the content of the whole dossier uh, the and to the information of the studies performed with the exception of the information that is granted confidential status. Now the general public can provide feedback to EFSA uh, regarding additional information that is available for the assessment of a substance or an ingredient and to make suggestions for the content of the application. And then the general public is also going to have access to knowing where the different studies supporting an application will be performed. Well, now we have finished uh, with the presentation. And in brief, we are going to continue sharing with you uh, all of the questions that we receive as part of the first edition of our webinar and also addressing the question that you submitted in advance. Okay, so let's get started with the question that we have received from the previous participants in this webinar. So one of the questions that we received was, will EFSA issue a guidance document on confidential information in the near future to provide clarification on this topic of transparency regulation? We do not expect to see an EFSA guidance for the transparency regulation. What we rather think that is going to happen is that EFSA is going to incorporate uh, the transparency regulations in the regulations that already exist. I mean, it is already contemplated for regulation 1831, uh, 1831 uh, that uh, covers feed additives and also contemplate, also probably we are going to get an update on regulation uh, 429, again related to feed additives. And we hope to see also the incorporation of these, of the topics that are relevant in the guidances that already exist, such as the safety guidance, the efficacy guidance, the identity guidance uh, for the case of, of feed additives. So no, we do not expect to see a new guidance uh, just for addressing transparency. Another question, how this regulation will impact the applications uh, on renewal or modification of authorizations? Uh, this is the case of Article 14 and 13 on Regulation 1831. As I said before, this is uh, the regulation that deals with feed additives. Well, in the first place, pre-submission advice is going to be required for the renewals, as we uh, showed you before. The applicant is going to have to wait for the authority's feedback before moving forward with any study. With the exception of the information that 
is acknowledged confidential status, now the content of the renewal dossier uh, or application will be made public. And then the case of modifications, well, the modifications are not mentioned on the regulation, but we assume that they will consider in the same way as a standard application. Somebody also asked us to please cover the impacts on products that are currently on the market. So there is not going to be a retroactive effect. And this means that the application submitted up until the 26th of March of 2021, that is a day before the application date, are not going to be released to the public in the format that is contemplated in this regulation. And this also, and it's also not going to affect the status of the data that is currently protected of or treated as confidential. So do not worry about that. Which points in the new regulation affect the CROs? We already covered this uh, in the summary, so I'm I just going to go through it very quickly. As we say, the contract risk organization must comply uh, with a notification to EPSA of the studies performed. It is still pending to clarify what will happen if the applicant notifies that the contract risk organization does not. All the CROs that are involved in studies that will be assessed by EFSA could receive an inspection from the authorities. The information about where, where all the type of studies uh, are performed is going to be released to the public. You have to mark the information regarding the name and the addresses of the people involved in the trials as confidential. And then the CROs could receive a direct request from EFSA for performing verification studies under their supervision. Somebody also wanted to know if we could keep more confidential than we currently can. As I said before, you can basically require as confidential the same things that you can request as confidential today, but you need to use more time for one, marking things as confidential that before were not released to the public, and two, provide justifications for every single thing that you want to request to be treated as confidential but it's not more, it's what you have to do in order to request confidentiality. Somebody also asked, how do we best handle EU registration products that recently started? Will it be an advantage for us to force them through to a submission to the EC and EFSA before March 2021? Or can we expect all trials performed before the deadline to be accepted? even though not notified and submitted after the enforcement date on March 2021. So what happens is that on 27th of March of 2021, the system for notifications should be up and running. So therefore, if you submit an application before March 2021, the application requirement is not going to apply. The system is not going to be even in place. So if you submit the full application before that, you do not have to worry about notifying. But if you submit an application after the 27th of March, then you have to notify the studies, the study regardless of the date when you perform it. So what is it is not important, important when you perform the study. What it is important is that if your application is going to be submitted after the 27th of March, you just notify the study before, once the system is available to do so. What happens if a company decides not to move forward uh, with an application? Are the notifications deleted from the EFSA database? The answer is we do not know. But what you do need to keep in mind is that now you have to prepare the two dossiers, the non-confidential version and the confidential version. And as soon as your application is considered valid, the non-confidential version is going to be released to the public. So therefore, if during the confidentiality assessment is where, where you do not agree with EFSA and you say, OK, this is not correct for me, I'm going to withdraw the application, what is going to happen is that that we, we expect to see that everything that was marked uh, as confidential is going to remain the same. But remember that the public version was already released. So that probably is going to still uh, be available to the public, even if you withdraw the application. In practice, how people is going to notify this, we still don't know. But let's assume that they use the EFSA register of question. So what we think that is going to happen if you decide to withdraw the application is that probably 
the non-confidential part is still going to be there, but then there is some type of notification that is going to say that the, this uh, application has been withdrawn. But again, we still don't know if, if the notifications are going to be uh, deleted from the database. What happens if you perform a study for a dossier approval in an ex-EU country and at a later date you decide to use this study also for a European submission and since then you have not notified it? Very simple. You just have to notify the study before you submit the dossier. That's it. Always, if you are after 27 of March and you're going to submit an application, notify the study before. Somebody told us, I believe that the study design should not be published in case of fit additives. This is, this is specified in the text for fit additives. The regulation contemplates that the study plans for the efficacy trials that support a fit additive application could be treated as confidential, but then the regulation is very clear. It says in terms of the aims of its intended use. So, so what we do not know so far is how much that definition is going to cover and how much of the study design we are going to be able to keep confidential after that definition. But also please notice that in the case of renewals, the transparency regulation is very clear. The authority should launch a consultation of stakeholders and the public on the intended studies for renewal, including on the proposed design of studies. Is there going to be an extra fee for pre-submission advice? What we told you at the beginning that we didn't know. Again, we don't know yet, but we think that it's unlikely. EFSA is looking to employ approximately 150 more staff in anticipation for this regulation. Uh, but this is something that, they, that we will definitely keep asking um, during the meetings that EFSA uh, is going to have before the transparency regulation applies. What will be the impact on submission before the applied from date, but that the scientific assessment continues after March 27? For any application submitted prior to the 27 of March, the transparency regulations will not apply. And we have also an update for you uh, from the technical group meeting on EFSA transparency database uh, that what he was held at EFSA uh, the 19 and 20 of February of this year. So before I go through some of the comments that we had for you, I just want to be very clear about the fact that these are still ongoing discussions. There is nothing set on a stone. We are just going to share with you what was discussed at the meeting and that it is still pending to, to decide something on these points. And also, uh, a lot of the questions that were addressed to the authority regarding these many DAOs that I have been discussing with you during the webinar uh, were not addressed because the objective of this meeting was, uh, was a meeting focused on the technical parts of the setting of the database uh, for notifications. So one of the things that it was discussed is uh, what happens if the applicant notifies the study but the contract research organization does not. So what EFSA is thinking at the moment and is discussing is that uh, it's about creating a system where there is a co-notification process. That means that the process is going to be started by the food business operator, by the applicant. They go to the website, they start the process, they notify the study, and then the system sends an alert to the contract research organization. So the contract research organization can also comply with their part of the notification obligation. And they are also thinking about uh, giving a time for, for the second part to introduce the notification, that it could be perhaps 30 days, and then if the information is not submitted by the contract research organization, then the applicant will have the opportunity to finish the notification. And they are also considering how it's going to work if you need to modify something uh, on that notification and then how it's going to work the interaction for the modification between the fit business operator and the contract research organization because both parts need to be aware of the modification. Uh, there were also discussions about the definition of what is considered the study start date and also the study end date. And what has been discussed at uh, the moment 
is that the study start date should be considered as the moment when the first set of relevant data is collected and then the end date is considered as the last date when relevant data is collected. But again, still, these are things that are under discussion. Regarding the language for notification of the studies, it seems that it's probably going to be English and then the authorities are thinking about incorporating the possibility into the system to include also a second language. Regarding the question, most all contract risk organizations in third countries comply with the notification requirement and which are those countries that have agreements uh, with the EU? Well, what EFSA ha told the participant is that initially this is considered as countries in the European Union, but also those countries in the economic European area, that it will be the case of Norway and Iceland. So for the moment, that is what they are considering regarding, they are considering for applying the notification requirement and also the fact-finding missions. Uh, in addition, uh, they are also contemplated to take advantage of countries with also a sort of notification system already exists, such as uh, the United States. But this is uh, still under discussion. There is a phrase in the notifications in the, uh, in the transparency regulation that states that the studies must be notified without delay. So there was a request to clarify what without delay means. Because it could be the case that at the moment you plan a set of studies with a product and right now you are not thinking about submitting those studies for an EFSA application. And you can decide in the next three to five years the now you want to submit them for EFSA evaluation. So this, this kind of situation raises uh, a lot of questions. So what um, we have been told at the moment is that the applicant needs uh, to notify the study as soon as possible before submitting the dossier. Then there is a case regarding studies that are performed in-house. So how do we notify in-house in studies, internal studies, those studies that if you are the applicant, you can perform at your company and you do not need a third party, a laboratory or an external, an external laboratory or an external contract risk organization involved. In the case of feed additives, we see it a lot, for example, with studies uh, for stability, where you're going to provide information about the shelf life and also on homogeneity. So what, EFSA, uh, what, what there is an agreement on is that these studies, of course, are only going to be notified by the applicant. There is not going to be a second party involved. And they are the only ones that are going to notify, but then they need to uh, are thinking about how to incorporate this in the notification system. Uh, and lastly, uh, we learned from this uh, meeting that the authority is planning to hold several more meetings and also teleconferences before the 27th of March of 2021 in order to address the many, many questions that uh, still are generating confusion uh, regarding the application of the transparency regulation and also uh, to keep, uh, EFSA wants to keep getting uh, feedback from everyone that is going to be affected, affected by the transparency regulation. Well, now we have finished uh, with our webinar. This was the, the last part that we have planned to share with you today. Thank you very much for joining us. And please feel free to contact us if you have any other questions, doubts, or if you would like to get uh, support from us um, regarding the implications of the transparency regulation for your food or your feed application. Here in this last slide, uh, I give you our contact details, so please feel free to use them. Thank you very much again for joining us. <laughs>